Good morning. I'm going to change the order in which we do things. We're going to start with prayer. Um, Caleb, at the end of the service, I'm going to have you come up so we can pray over you. Okay? But right now, how can we pray with you this week? Well, he's the Pocatello. He was asked to do the opening prayer for the children when I was going by his bike. And so I heard that Elko was going with the bike. He's looking safe. Two of them. He's leaving Thursday. Okay. When will you be back, Cordy? I'm um, planning on Sunday, maybe Monday. Okay. Or I'll leave early in the morning, so. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Um. Last week we asked for a prayer for Craig, and he passed away on Friday, so just prayers for the whole family. Yeah. What's the family's name? It's um, Chris Cranley. Right. His brothers. Yes, it's Chris's father. Right. Yeah. 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 Did I see your hand? Yeah. Prayer for everyone associated with the fires that are going on. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah I saw another hand. Kathy. Can I add a praise? Yes, absolutely. Okay, he is home from the hospital. Yes. <laughs> In wonder of the world around her. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Very cool. Okay. Um, about a week and a half ago, my mom fell and broke her right shoulder. Okay. She just had surgery um, last Wednesday to put a plate in it in 12 screws. So just a uh, prayer that she heals. What is her name? Sharon. Sharon. Uh, the tread was like coming off of it. Oh, oh wow. 
sure we had driven all the way over there. Wow. <laughs> and just it's a, just amazing that we didn't have a blowout on the way. way. Yeah. So yeah. I was able to go out and get new tires. It took about 45 minutes for me to go to Costco and get a new set of tires, and we we were safe. But it just awesome. God was yes. Out for <laughs> the guy when he, you know, all four tires were kind of coming apart, and uh, the guy with the at the garage when he took the one tire off that looked really bad. He said, I can't believe you even made it down. Wow. <laughs> wow. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Okay, hey, Gordy. Ernie has come in from uh, Walla Washington today. Okay. For her travel wishes. Okay, what's her name? Uh, Yvonne. Yvonne. Hey, Chris, I saw your hand. Um, to add to Maida, her family, her daughter, um, didn't doesn't want her to have any kind of funeral for her husband, and it, it's just a burdening on my heart and many others that she's not getting the closure she needs mm -hmm. for her part in life forever. Okay. So I pr want to pray about that. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Problem. Yeah, my daughter Greg just made it for safely, so just to have a nice visit. Awesome. Take it back down her safely again. Too. Awesome. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have all of you. All right. Anyone else? Grace. Just if we could lift up your camera. Any change at all? No. Okay. Just things are getting kind of worse for him actually, so we changed the worse, but just like that would just okay. light a fire for Jesus to set it Anyone else? Okay. Anyone else? Ready? I'm uh, Jeff with Ken. He just doesn't have nothing to do anything. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, Gene. My daughter, Allison, is coming to visit from Pennsylvania this week. Her purpose is to organize me. <laughs> so I would just pray, ask if you would pray for me and my um, that that, uh, that we can not have any conflicts okay. and that we have a great time. She is she is a Christian, and so that we can just both have some fellowship along the way. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Anyone else? Ken. Prayer for a gentleman that lives in Corvallis that's a brother of a sister of a semi class, but he's blind. I know him as a kid, although he's almost my age, but uh, you know, I don't know where he stands. He's blind, he's got a lot of health issues, and I'm trying to get together with him. Yeah. And it seems kind of standoffish at this point. So, Great. You've got to open that door that he'll feel comfortable meeting with us or with me. What is his name? Danny. Danny. Okay. Dan McClue okay. is his last name. Sorry? McClue. McClue. Okay. Anyone else? <coughs> This is work for the paint job and find a groove and get settled in. Okay. If it's even up, it's better. <coughs> Anyone else? Okay. Let's pray. <coughs> yeah. Father, I thank you that we have the freedom, the privilege to come before you. Father, that we can speak your name, proclaim your praises before people without fear of the government coming against us, without fear of, of, of hostilities. I thank you, Father, that you have made a way that we can come boldly before your throne of grace in our time of need. I thank you, Father, that you've given us your word. And you've promised us in your word that when we pray, you would hear us and that you are already moving Father, for those that are traveling this week, we ask for traveling mercies. We ask uh, that you would keep Gordy safe as he goes down and, and leads the opening prayer.
for the POW rally. We thank you, Father, for Robin and Carolyn's daughter and grandchildren that were able to come safely, Father. We thank you, Father, that your hand is on them and just ask for a good visit and a good trip. We pray, Father, for Chris and his family with the loss of his father. I ask, Father, that your peace would be more real to them than they've ever experienced. And I pray, Father, that this would be a testimony to not just your existence, but to your goodness. We pray, Father, for Hannah going out to Thailand to be able to minister. Father, as she's gone before and this group has gone many times, I ask that you would anoint them, that you would give them everything that they need to minister effectively exactly as you would have them minister. We pray, Father, that this would be effective for your kingdom. We pray also for Krisha and the results uh, from these tests, Father, and, and this possibility of an autoimmune disorder. We ask, Father, that you would give the doctors wisdom, give Krisha wisdom. Help them, Father, to take the steps that are necessary to address the issues that she's been having. We thank you, Father, that there are no other problems that have been, been found. We pray, Father, also for Maida, and, and Father, with the loss of her hus husband and, and the potential conflict with her daughter, I ask, Father, that you would order things perfectly for her, that, Father, she would find the closure, that she would find her peace, that, Father, she would rest in you. And I pray, Father, that, that uh, this would be a time of bonding for her and her daughter, not a time of separation. <coughs> Pray, Father, also for the fire crews. We thank you, Father, for these men and women that go out and, and do the hard work and put their lives on the line to keep us safe. We ask, Father, that you would keep them safe. We pray, Father, for the, the fires around us in the valley and in so many other places. Uh, just pray, Father, that in the midst of all of this, your people would be a, a bright and a shining light, stepping forward to help where help is needed in whatever manner it would be needed. We pray, Father, for Sharon and this, this shoulder injury and the, the surgery. I thank you, Father, that we live in a place that she could get the attention that she needs. But, Father, we ask for healing. We ask that you would speed healing to her from the surgery and that she would recover the use of her arm and her shoulder. We pray, Father, also uh, for Yvonne and her travels. We ask that you would uh, take her safely, Father, that your angels would go with her and protect her. We pray, Father, also for Nathaniel. And Father, I, I just ask that you would put him in that place where he would turn to you and call out. And that, Father, he would see you move by your mighty hand. And that, Father, he would become yours to such a degree that people would be amazed at his testimony. We pray also for his family that through him they might come to know you. We pray, Father, for the McNamara family. And, and Father, we ask again that those that are believers would be encouraged and strengthened. That, Father, you would keep yourself centered in their minds, in their speech, in their actions. That those that do not believe, Father, might see truth in them. We pray, Father, that you would draw those that don't believe to yourself. And that, Father, that family might be restored and might be healed. We pray, Father, for Ted as he's not feeling well and, and just under the weather. We ask, Father, for a special touch for him. He has been so faithful in the things that you've given him to do at this church. And we ask, Father, for your healing to be on him. We pray for Allison and Jean as they uh, come together this week. And, and, Father, I ask that you would set aside the plans of man and that you would order their steps. Father, as believers, they would come together in fellowship, sweet fellowship. That, Father, their, their conversation would be glorifying to you and that this would be a time of building and not tearing down, a time of healing and a good time of fellowship. We pray, Father, for Dan and this opportunity that Ken has to minister to him. I pray, Father, that you would open the doors that need to be opened that you would soften Dan's heart, open his ears that he might hear, that you would give Ken the words to speak, to share. We pray also for Benjamin as uh, the work at the paycheck has, has just been uh, spotty and, and 
difficult. I ask, Father, that you would give him your favor in the eyes of his employers, that he would be a Joseph in his workplace, and they would be blessed because he is working for them. We pray over Jesus Community Church, Father, over this fellowship, that, Father, you would put a fire in our hearts, that you would cause us to hunger and thirst after you, and that, Father, we would be your representatives in all that we do and all that we say. Father, that we would be your ambassadors to this world, that we would carry your truth out from these walls into the communities in which we live, and that, Father, we might honor you with our lives. We pray these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. If you have your Bibles, open to Hebrews chapter 6. We've been working on discipleship and what being a disciple is and we've been looking at Hebrews because in chapter 6 the writer of Hebrews lays out what he calls the elementary doctrines now this is not an all-inclusive list this this list is just pointing out some examples but he's pointing out examples that are basic these are foundational. Um, I'm going to back up into chapter 5 because the author did not write with chapter and verse in mind. We actually put those in for our ease so that we can both get to the same page and the same place in the reading. Um, so I'm going to back up into chapter 5 because chapter 6 actually builds off of chapter 5. So the author has been talking about Jesus as our great high priest. And he's, he's calling him a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, who is this book written to? Hebrews. Well, the Hebrews. Is anybody here Hebrews? Anybody here Jewish? Anybody got a little bit of Jewish in them? I got a little bit. I don't know how that worked, but it's there. Okay. Does this mean we can disregard this book? No. No. Because the author of this book is writing under the divine inspiration and he's thinking along the track that God has given him but God's thinking is greater than man's and so God saw fit to include this as his word to us okay but we need to understand that the author is writing with an intentional group in mind and there's a culture that we have not grown up in okay so the things that he's saying we need to adjust our Western Greek thinking to an Eastern Hebrew thinking to get the fullness of what he's trying to share here. Okay? So, in verse 11, chapter 5, he's talking about Jesus being of the order of Melchizedek, and he says, About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. I've said this before, but this is one of the most dangerous places for a Christian to be dull of hearing. Some of your translations might, might say hard of hearing. Okay? It's a dangerous place because it, it allows us to ignore certain cautions. And, and the harder our ears become, the less truth is able to penetrate us. So he's saying, uh, it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. Your babies, your babes. Here you should be adults and mature, but you're still children. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, what's the therefore, therefore? 
because he's saying you're children and you need to be mature. And because of this, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. We are looking at these six doctrines that the writer of Hebrews tells us are elementary to the Christian faith. Now we've already looked at repentance from dead works. We've looked at faith toward God. And we're looking at instruction about washings. Now, does anybody have a different re reading there, instructions of washings? Does anybody's Bible have a different translation there? Baptism. Baptism? Cleansing okay. Rites. I'm sorry? Cleansing rites. Cleansing rites. Anybody have something different between washings, cleansing rites, baptism? Okay. Now, a couple weeks ago, we started this. We had to take kind of a, a break in the middle to accomplish some other things that needed to be addressed. But I spent the sermon talking about cleansing rites, ceremonial washings in the Old Testament. And afterwards, someone came to me and said, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but what does this have to do with us? Because everything that I was teaching was the, the law that God had implemented for the Jews to be separate. And, and Paul tells us that we are not under the law, but we're under grace. So what does this have to do with us. And I'm so glad you asked. I, I was watching a video with Robbie Zacharias and he told a story. I want to share it with you. I'm going to read it because it's his story and I don't want to mess it up. And he says, I remember lecturing at Ohio State University, one of the largest universities in this country. I was minutes away from beginning my lecture and my host was driving me past a new building called the Wexner Center for the performing arts. He said, this is America's first postmodern building. I was startled for a moment and I said, what is a postmodern building? He said, well, the architect said that he designed this building with no design in mind. When the architect was asked why, he said, if life is capricious, why should our buildings have any design and any meaning? So he has pillars that have no purpose. He has stairways that go nowhere. He has a senseless building built and somebody paid for it. I said, so his argument was that if life has no purpose and design, why should the building have any design? He said, that is correct. I said, did he do the same with the foundation? Mm. this is something that we need to wrap our brains around we need to wrap we need to saturate our soul with this understanding when God gave us the New Testament it was not a book unto itself it was built on the foundation of the Hebrew Bible <laughs> Those things that we receive in the New Testament are a fulfillment of, a furtherance of, those things that God instituted from Genesis to Malachi. And for us to have a, a full understanding, a deeper meaning of what the authors in the New Testament are writing about, what they're trying to speak to us across the ages about, we need to understand where they're coming from. They're coming from a background, a a group of people that God had called out millennia ago of all the people in the world and he chose to make them his people so that through them he could bless the world that through them he could reconcile the world to himself okay and as such God wrote inspired every bit as divinely Genesis through Malachi 
one of the things that really frustrates me is when churches do a baptism or a, a uh, dedication service or, or anything like that, and they give the people a New Testament Bible. You're getting the end of the story without understanding the beginning. Now, that's not to say that God does not use the New Testament. He absolutely does. But I think it would be fruitless of us to say that you, you only need the New Testament. That would be just like the Jews saying, well, we only need the Old. Okay? They were written to be two parts of one whole. Okay? So when I spent time talking about the Jewish custom, the Jewish law of ceremonial washings, it was so that you would understand where our grasp of baptism comes from. We say, well, okay, well, Jesus told us to get baptized. That's why we do it. But Jesus understood what God had required of the Jewish people because he was a Jew. He was perfect according to the law. So the ceremonial washings that, that we read, we read through a list of about 15 different things. You had to wash if you had a skin issue. You had to wash if you were going up to the temple. You had to wash if you got new dinnerware. There were thing after thing after thing that you had to wash. We talked about the mikvahs, the baths that they used where they would go down into the water and then they would come up and be considered ceremonially clean. Okay? Now, we take that, that's the foundation of our baptism. I believe that God did this, He put so many strictures on the Jews so they would understand they're not clean. They're not righteous. That apart from God, they are nothing. And, and when we come to God, we have to come with that same understanding that, that we are not clean. That our righteousness is as filthy rags. If you come to God in any other manner, I don't believe you can have true salvation. I really don't. Because if you come to God thinking you've got anything in your favor, you really don't need Him. It's only when you understand that you have nothing going for you. And that He loved you every bit as much then as He loves you now. He can never love you more than He loves you right in this moment. It's that moment when you come to Him and you just throw it all down. God, I've got nothing to offer you. Take, take everything that I am. Do with it as you will. And you change from a slave to sin, being stuck in that bondage because you don't know any different. You don't know how not to. And you become an instrument of righteousness. So today we're going to talk about why do we baptize? I mean, that's a Jewish custom. It's a Jewish law. We don't sacrifice animals. So why do we baptize? I'm glad you asked. Because i got a bunch of things written down to answer you. <clears throat> we finished the last time we talk, talked about baptism bringing us up to the New Testament time. In the New Testament, we see, right off the bat, we see the ministry of John. John the Baptist. That does not mean that John was a member of the church across the street. It does not mean that he was Southern Baptist or Independent Baptist or Free Will Baptist. It means that John baptized. Okay? And, and so, we see from the stories, because John is in each of the Gospel accounts, 
As a matter of fact, the, the story of the baptism of Jesus is one of the few events throughout the ministry of Jesus that is told in every single gospel. And so we see that people are coming to be baptized and they're not going, oh, what is this new thing? They see that, that John is calling them to a baptism of water for repentance. One of the things that really jumped out at me when I was doing my studies that I had not really noticed before is that when John called the people to repent, he also called them to confess. One of the greatest failings of the church in America today, I'm convinced, is that we have ceased to be a church that confesses and become a church that professes. Not that profession is wrong. As a matter of fact, we are to declare His praises. Psalms tells us that we, we declare His praises before the great congregation. That means you guys are great. Did you get that? Okay. And so, John is calling people to come out to confess their sins, to confess. Does anybody know what confess means? Really, what does confess mean? To agree. What? To agree. To agree. When you confess, you are agreeing to whatever has been said. When you confess to a crime, you are agreeing to the fact that, that you did this. When you make a confession, you are agreeing with God that what He says is right and you've done what He said you did. You're, you're confessing that God is not a liar. Okay? And so they came, they confessed, and hand in glove with confession should always come repentance. Now we talked about that five, six weeks ago. We talked about repentance. Repentance is, is a, a conviction in your life that you need to turn from something and to something. Okay? So when confession comes forth, it's because you have been convicted, you have been accused and, and declared, and, and your confession is, he's right. He's right. And so then you repent and you say, okay, take from me these things, this, this, this direction I was going, these things I was doing, and, and turn me in a new direction. Okay? Now... As John was calling the people and they were coming out, uh, there was a group of people that, that John had a problem with. Who was that? The Pharisees. Sorry? The Pharisees. The Pharisees. The religious leaders. The churchy people. Mm -hmm. and, and they were coming out to see what was going on and he starts calling them snakes. And, and man, he is, he, John's telling it like it is. Now, it's interesting, when we were in, in Israel, we got the opportunity to go to Qumran. Um, does anybody know what Qumran is? Qumran village? The Dead Sea Scrolls? Okay, that's where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls that have literally thousands of manuscripts from first century. And, and using these new manuscripts, they were able to hold them up in light of, of the translations that we had existing, and they were able to see how God has kept His hand on His Word. And He has kept His Word true. Okay? Now, Qumran was a village south of En Gedi that the Essenes lived. Now, the Essenes were an ascetic people, uh, they had separated themselves out from Israel, out from, from Jerusalem. Uh, they looked and they saw that the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they believed, had forsaken God. And they had compromised, which is funny because that's what the Pharisees thought of the Sadducees. Uh, each one thought that they were more holy than the other. And, and, but the, the Essenes, they actually took themselves out from the people. And they settled in communities, Qumran being one. And they called themselves the children of light. Okay? And, and they believed that only they were the faithful and that when the Messiah came, 
they were going to be the ones that would be mounted on the horses with him, and they would go and they would purge the world of the children of darkness. And to them, that included the rest of the Jewish people who were not faithful. Now, it is speculated, and I believe with good reason, that John spent a significant amount of time in growing up and before his ministry living with the Essenes. Uh, some of the similarities that we see between them, the area that, that he baptized was due east of the Qumran village, a little bit north up at the Jordan River. Um, we see that John dressed in camel hair and ate locusts. Does, anybody, does that remind anyone of someone else in the Bible? Elijah. Elijah, the Tishbite. Okay? Which is not ironic, it's prophetic. Because Malachi says that before the Messiah comes, a forerunner would come, Elijah. And Jesus says that, that John was the Elijah to come. Okay, So here's John, who being filled with the Spirit of God from being in his mother's womb, the first one outside of Mary and Joseph to acknowledge the Messiah had come. He's not even born yet. He's... We're guessing between six and nine months pregnant, and, and he jumps in his mother's womb when, when Mary comes in. Okay? So here's John, and he's doing this baptism of repentance. What was John's purpose? What, why did God send John first? To prepare the hearts of the people for Christ. Prepare the way. That's right. I am a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. And they were saying, are you the one that was prophesied? Are you the one that's coming? He says, no, I'm not him. I, I, I'm not him. He, but he's coming after me, and, and I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with fire. Okay? So, we understand from the way that things are presented in each of the four Gospels that the Jews had a familiarity with this baptism, this baptism of repentance. Um, <clears throat> In the Protestant church, we are Protestants, by the way, which, which derives its name from protesters, because our church roots go back to the protestation of, of the problems that were rampant in the Catholic Church when Martin Luther first nailed up his thesis. Um, so we are part of the protesters, okay? which is, is really kind of funny because the Pharisees were the same people. They, they were the protesters. They were the ones that stood up against the Sadducees and said, no, what you're doing is wrong. We need to return to righteousness. Okay, so we're kind of like the modern day Pharisees. Take that as a warning. <laughs> Okay? Seriously, take that as a warning. Because you get into a place of comfort with your relationship and your religion, and all of a sudden it's not about relationship, it's about religion. And, and then you start casting on others things that God has not called them to. Okay? So, <clears throat> in the Protestant faith, we have two ordinances. Does anybody know what they are? Communion and baptism. Communion and baptism. Now, they're called ordinances because these are things that were ordained of Christ for us to continue doing until He comes back. Okay? The first one, at the Last Supper, when they're, they're celebrating the Passover, Jesus said, as often as you do this, in remembrance of Me, you proclaim the Lord's Supper. Okay? So, He's saying, you, you do this. You, you, we're going to keep doing this. I think... The, the disciples understood that because the Passover was a yearly feast. Okay? But, but we don't really celebrate the Passover, do we? I think we should. Why? Because it is the prototype, it is the forerunner of the passing over of sin that, that God caused the angel of death to pass over those who were marked with the blood just as we, being marked with the blood, will be passed over by death. The eternal death, that separation from God. Okay? So, communion and baptism. Baptism. 
The Gospels tell us that after Jesus had rose, He gave the commission to the disciples, to the church, to go, to preach, and to baptize. This is one of the most solid, in-your-face evidences that we have of the, the doctrine of the Trinity. Because He doesn't tell them to go and baptize in the name of the Father or in the name of Yahweh. He tells them to go and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. The three being equal. Okay? Being in one in essence, but three in person. Okay? So, in these two things, we receive from the Scripture ordinances of things that we should do. So, in talking about baptism, why do we baptize? Well, first we baptize because Jesus told us to. He said, go and baptize. Preach and baptize. Okay? Um, my personal belief is that baptism should be by immersion. Okay? The, the word baptism is stolen from the, the, the Greek language, baptismos, and it means to immerse, to dunk, to dip. Okay? And, and I'm not saying that if you were sprinkled, you're not properly baptized. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying the opportunity avails itself. <coughs> dunk yourself. Get dunked. Because Romans chapter 6, which we'll get to in a minute, tells us what baptism means to the church. Okay? But I want to start off by saying what baptism isn't. Okay? And this is, has been a, a conflict in the church going back for, for millennia, almost two full, two full millennia. Baptism is not unto salvation. Okay? Baptism is a result of salvation. Okay, why do I say this? Well, there are a couple examples in the book of Acts. We're going to turn to the first one. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to the book of Acts, uh, chapter, I think it's three. Hang on just a second, I'll get there and tell you. Nope, two. So, second chapter of Acts is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. This is a, a pulling back to, does anybody remember in the Old Testament where there were tongues of fire? I know Jeannie does. Because she's the one that pointed it out to me. Remember Korah's rebellion when Moses was in the desert and Korah and, and some of the others stood up and they said, why should we follow you? We are also men of God. And, and why should we listen to Aaron? And, and so God told Moses and Moses separated them from himself and Aaron and, and basically said, okay, God, you choose. And the earth opened up and swallowed some and fire jumped and killed others. This is, the, this is the, the kind of bringing that back around. As the one was under separation, the other is to bring him together, to, to birthing the church. Okay? And as they're receiving the Holy Spirit, they begin to speak in other tongues, and, and the people out uh, around them are hearing the gospel proclaimed in their native languages, in their native tongues, and, and it's weird. It's, it's unusual. And, and there's, there's an excitement, there's a, a fervor, and, and, they, and some of the people start to, to kind of jape at them, and, and they say, well, you know, huh, they're drunk. Look at these guys, they're drunk. And, and Peter stands up and he says, no, we're not drunk. At least not drunk the way you would think we would be drunk. He says, we're, we're receiving what was promised. And he goes through and he lays out the gospel. 
And then jumping all the way down, he says, uh, verse 37, chapter 2, he says, um, actually, I'm going to back up to 36. He says, let all the house of Israel, therefore, know for certain that God has made him, being Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Okay? Lord and Christ. Why are those? Why would he say those two things? God never puts anything on his word on accident. Everything that is in there is in there intentionally. Lord and Christ. What is Christ? Anointed. The anointed. It's, it's the Greek word to, for anointed that comes from the, the Hebrew word um, Messiah, Mashiach. And so Jesus is the Savior a lot of people want Jesus to be their Savior, but they reject Him as Lord. You don't get one without the other. Okay? Because He is both Lord and Christ. So, He is the one that saves, but He is also the one that's in charge. He's the boss. Scripture tells us that because of His sacrifice, because of His willingness, that every knee would bow. See, you need to understand, you don't get a choice as to whether or not you bow. The only choice you get is when. You can do it of your own volition. When God's Spirit moves on you and you bow your knee and you call Him Lord. Or, on that day when all the nations are gathered before Him, the Almighty Presence of God will cause you to fall on your knees and declare Him Lord. Now the one will be done with arms open to receive, the other will be with fist raised and hatred in your heart. Because you will see He is who He has said He is. And you have rejected Him. Okay? So, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. By the way, whom you crucified, that includes us. Well, I wasn't there. I wasn't even born yet. Yeah, but it was for your sins that He went to the cross. Every bit as much as theirs. Okay? 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now this passage, along with a couple other things that happened throughout the book of Acts, has led some people to believe that in order to be saved, you have to repent and be baptized. And then you will be saved. Now the problem is, there's a little Greek word that's stuck in there that trips us up. The Greek word is is, E-I-S. And it means, what we most often translate it is for. Okay? And, and so we repeat, uh, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. So that, that interpretation means you can take that to read, okay, if I repent and if I'm baptized, then I will be forgiven. But, but for can be in direction of or as a result of. And I believe absolutely the first rule of hermeneutics, the first rule of Bible study, is that all Scripture is interpreted in light of all Scripture. Okay? That means that you can't take one verse out and disregard the rest because that one verse can lead you astray. For example, uh, baptizing the dead. You, you know the, the story of the fool that wanted God to speak to him through his word, so he opened up the Bible. And he read the part about Judas where it says, and Judas went and hanged himself. He went, oh, had to close the Bible. He opened it up again. And it said, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> you see, if you do not follow faithfully through with God's word, you can get led astray. So interpreting all of God's word in light of all of God's word, what is our formula for salvation? Ephesians chapter 2. Grace plus faith 
equals salvation, salvation. unto works. If you could do something to be saved, would it be grace? No. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. That little word, if, I am absolutely convinced that word means repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, because of the forgiveness of sins. Because it's already a done deal. Jesus has already gone to the cross. All that is required of us is to say yes with the faith that God gives us. Okay? I, I, I believe that if you have true salvation, you're going to repent. Because you're going to see how far removed from God you are. I, I believe absolutely that when you come to Christ, you should be baptized. Absolutely. Why? Because you are going to declare to the world that you are no longer your own. You're no longer the world. You're no longer of the devil. You're not a child of the devil anymore. You have become one of God's. Next week we're going to wrap up baptism with a little bit further understanding. Um, what I want you to take away from this today. One. We baptize and are baptized because Christ has said... We should. Two. We'll touch on this next week. We are baptized because Jesus was baptized. And we are His followers. We are His disciples. So, takeaway for today, if you have not been baptized, I'm going to add a, a caveat to this. If you have been baptized, but it didn't mean anything to you, I, I was baptized before I can even remember in the Lutheran church because that's what my family did. When you were born and you were little, you went to the church and you got baptized. Okay? That didn't mean anything to me. It meant a lot to my grandmother. I'm not sure how much it meant to my mother, but it didn't mean anything to me. I don't remember anything. I made no conscious decision to get baptized. I went and somebody threw water in my face. Okay? Wow. How much more lively would our service be if I stood up here and threw water in your face? Uh, you could try it sometime. <laughs> oh, you don't know what you just did. <laughs> yeah. So, if you have not been baptized, if you were baptized and, and it didn't mean anything to you, we are doing a baptism August 6th. We will have service. We will do, do, um, we do communion. We will go back, share potluck, and then we will go down to Bell Crossing and we will do baptism. Come talk to me. Okay? Thus far, I have had three people come talk to me that have already been baptized but they were baptized as children and, and did not understand what it was. Okay? If you have not been baptized, come talk to me. Okay? This is something that every Christian is called to. Not unto salvation, but as a result of salvation. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You, Father, that Your Spirit has been sent to teach us, to comfort us, to counsel us, to convict us. I thank you, Father, that you have built the body of Christ, that we would be interdependent on one another. That, Father, where I am lacking, another will be strong. Father, that we work together to accomplish your purposes and your plans to further your kingdom. I ask, Father, that you would bless the reading of your word. I ask, Father, that you would open our ears, that we would hear our hearts that we would receive, our minds that we would understand. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.